So, so we're, we're pretty clear. I mean, we know that sequential therapy is best. We know that TKI followed by either TKI or TOR inhibitor or TOR inhibitor followed by TKI is pretty much the standard. We sprinkle in a little bit of high-dose interleukin-2 for the appropriate patient in the upfront setting. Um, we know that Devotinib, uh, an FGF inhibitor, failed in, in the third-line setting to, to demonstrate a, an improvement, so we have an unmet medical need in the third-line setting. So, Dr. Paul, t talk about the Meteor trial, a trial which is close to accrual. It's met its, its target. What is it about cabozantinib that makes it attractive in this space? Obviously, we have no results that are in the public domain, but what about that drug offers us an opportunity to see a difference compared with its, uh, what it's being randomized against? Sure, sure. So cabozantinib, which is being evaluated in the Meteor trial, is a drug that blocks both VEGF receptor 2, but also MET. And we've previously talked about MET in this conversation in the context of papillary renal cell carcinoma. I think one of the key points to acknowledge is that MET may potentially be a bypass mechanism for VEGF receptor signaling, and therefore could potentially play a role in the context of clear cell disease as well. Uh, Tony Chueri and I and several others uh, participated in a phase one clinical trial, which was just published in the Annals of Oncology. We really saw an impressive progression-free survival in a cohort of about 25 patients um, or over a year, in fact, uh, and some durable responses in that cohort of patients. And that really fueled this phase three exploration, uh, comparing everolimus versus cabozantinib in the second or third line setting. The trial is powered to look at progression-free survival, and I certainly look forward to the results. So, Dr. Paul, uh, we know the cabozantinib affects both MET and VEGFR. Um, do, do your data in that early population of patients, knowing that MET abnormalities in clear cell are not all that common, mm -hmm. uh, help you understand whether that's going to be just reintroducing a VEGFR inhibitor or the MET inhibition is really going to be a sine qua non of potential benefit? Sure, sure. So from a clinical perspective, I would suggest that in that phase one cohort, we had patients that received up to four or five prior lines of therapy the thought there being that perhaps that VEGF signaling access was burned out. So I think the activity that we saw in that phase one trial must have been driven at least to some extent by MET antagonism. Uh, from a preclinical standpoint, I think we're going to have an outstanding opportunity in uh, the Meteor trial to conduct some translational studies that may potentially inform whether or not there were fluxes in HGF uh, MET itself, in fact, uh, that might have driven the activity of the drug. And, and Dr. George, just to, again to close out this segment before we get to experimental therapy, absent clinical trials with commercially available agents, um, when do you exhaust commercially available agents? After two cycles, after three, in, in terms of TKI, TOR, TKI, 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 TOR, when do you call it a day and say these patients are best served by a clinical trial? So uh, that is a philosophical question again. It's a, it's a very good question we, where we don't have a good answer. Thank you, Dr. Figlin, for bringing that up. And um, so the third line trial of gold trial, dovitinib as compared to sorafenib um, in the third line, um, and uh, it, it demonstrated that there was no difference in PFS or OS. OS the PFS was uh, 3.6, 3.7 months. Uh, for both, and uh, the overall survival was in the range of 11 months. So basically a negative study. Um, uh, so uh, it's not stellar data, but uh, in real life practice, how I, I, I do the sequences, uh, I try to start with a TKI, VEGF TKI, then go to an mTOR inhibitor, um, which is most likely a Verolimus, uh, and then go to um, go to another TKI, either exitinib, and then maybe subsequently sorafenib, or so try to do that. But you know, most of, the, most of us are practicing at centers where we have uh, clinical trials available. So I try to enroll patients on trials preferentially if we have a trial in that setting. Um, so um, most of the um, trials done in the treatment of fractal settings allow for up to second through fourth line, or two to three um, prior treatments. Um, so, which, which is prefer preferentially what I try to do in that setting. And, uh, and, and again, 
there was some, some retrospective data uh, generated by Dr. Weenie uh, by, um, you know, re-challenging, you know, some of the TKIs after, uh, uh, after prior use, which, which might uh, also show some, uh, some, some activity. So, so I, I believe um, that, you know, reintroducing a TKI later in the, in the line of treatment might, might do something than nothing. So try to, uh, you know, fight for the patient uh, as much as possible. Yeah, I just, I think, and I agree with you completely, I think the one thing that I'm seeing is that since we have so many commercially available agents and uh, we're looking for next generation, front line, second line, and third line therapy, and the eligibility criteria for those populations are pretty strict, that we often see patients that are ineligible because of all the numbers of lines of therapy that they ha they've had before. And I would just encourage our colleagues in the community uh, to consider a trial because you can always come back to a standard of care agent, but if you exhaust all standard of care agents, you've also exhausted the opportunity for clinical trial participation. And that's something that I think we need to educate them about. So